Hi, welcome to everyone who's joined us for the teaching of uh, the scriptures. And uh, we look to God for his blessing. As we consider the last chapter of Mark's gospel, we've, we've made it. Finally, we've got to the end. It's been rather uh, a um, rather a quick journey through Mark's gospel. Uh, and we've had some big chunks, uh, but it's been good to consider uh, the Lord is the perfect servant, hasn't it? So we'll just ask the Lord for help as we consider this final chapter before we read chapter 16 together. Oh God, we're grateful that you have uh, left on record the accounts of the life and the death and the uh, resurrection and the glorification of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we give thanks that as we come to this last section uh, of uh, Mark's gospel today, uh, we give thanks that <coughs> uh, we leave behind the suffering uh, and we come to uh, the glory. Uh, we give thanks that we uh, are able to have brought before us the glorious and the wonderful uh, and the eternal truth uh, that the Lord Jesus is risen indeed. And so we pray that our hearts might be encouraged and stirred as we just consider uh, him and the significance and the impact uh, of the resurrection this morning. And we give our grateful thanks uh, in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, and we we'll read from verse number one. <clears throat> Mark 16, verse one. And when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulchre at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll, or, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre? And when they looked, they saw the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in a long white garment. And they were affrighted. And he saith unto them, be not affrighted. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified? He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulchre, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Now, when Jesus was risen early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven devils. And she went and told them that had been with him as they mourned and wept. And they, when they had heard that he was alive and had been seen of her, believed not. After that, he appeared in another form unto two of them as they walked and went into the country. And they went and told it unto the residue, neither believed they them. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat and upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them which had seen him after he was risen. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven, and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. And we look to God for his blessing upon his word as Mark in characteristically uh, brief, succinct, but powerful uh, writing uh, brings his gospel to a triumphant conclusion. And as we've considered the, the, the servant as he came and as he served and uh, as he died, uh, it's good to be able to just come, isn't it, to the end and uh, to rejoice in the, tri the, the servant's uh, triumph. Uh, one commentator said this regarding the resurrection and the different accounts that we have uh, in the different gospels. He says, 
Matthew shows that it was an invincible act, that there was nothing and no one who could stop it. Luke claims that it was indispensable. Luke says, quoting the words of the Lord Jesus, ought not Christ to have suffered and then to enter into his glory? And so the resurrection is indispensable. John sets forth indisputable evidences. As he claims in chapter 20, these things were written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God. And Mark emphasizes that it was inevitable. If you notice in verse number 17, that it says there, um, uh, sorry, not verse 17, uh, verse number Verse number 11, I think it is. No, sorry, not number 11. Oh, sorry, verse number 7. Sorry, not 17, verse 7. Uh, the angel says, uh, go your way. Tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There ye shall see him as he said. And so Mark records it as inevitable. The Lord Jesus had said it would happen, and it did. So we divide the chapter into eight sections, verses one to eight, then verses nine to 14, verses 15 to 18 and 19 to 20. The first section deals with the shock at the sepulchre. Uh, the second section deals with the revealing of the resurrected Lord. The third section deals with the commission for the company of believers. And uh, the last section would deal with laboring for the Lord, laboring for the Lord. So verses one to eight, we have uh, the shock at the sepulcher, shock at the sepulcher. Verses one and two, we have uh, a great saver, a great saver, uh, not saviour, but a great saver. And we get that from uh, the fact that the women were bringing uh, numerous uh, spices. But I don't think it was just the, the saver from the spices that uh, uh, creates a great savor here. But I think, too, uh, that we have the desire and the devotion of these ladies, which must have brought uh, some pleasure from the heart of God. And in using the picture language of the sacrifices of the Old Testament, as they would rise up as uh, an acceptable savor uh, to God. And these ladies brought uh, these sweet spices and sought to honor the Lord Jesus in what they were doing. I want you to notice, first of all, the time. The Sabbath was past. As good Jews, they had observed the Sabbath, they had rested, uh, but at the very earliest opportunity, they would seek to come out to anoint the body of the Lord Jesus. You know, I thought it was an interesting um, uh, point that they rested on the Sabbath. You know, this was something that they would uh, seek to do to honor the Lord. Uh, they would seek to anoint the body and show their devotion and their appreciation for him. But they recognized that to truly honor the Lord, uh, they should obey the word of God. And how true it is that we should test everything that we do by the standard of scripture. You know, we might think that something will bring honor to the Lord Jesus, and it may well do in its right and proper context, uh, but not if we step outside the bounds of the word of God. It's lovely to notice uh, the devotion of these ladies is bounded by their devotion to the scriptures and the two things combine as they come on the first day of the week. You know, this, this significant foundation event uh, of the Christian uh, faith, the Christian message occurs on the first day of the week. It's no wonder, therefore, that down through the centuries, believers have met on a uh, Lord's Day. But notice that they came very early. Uh, you know, it's interesting as we go through scripture that there's various mentions of uh, believers doing things very early or uh, as soon as the morning was come. You know, how often do we put off things that we know that we ought to do 
here were these ladies and they wanted to show their devotion. And so very early in the morning, as soon as they could, they stepped out to seek to honor the Lord in this service for him. And so the time, it was after the Sabbath and it was very early on the first day of the week. I want you to notice the people, the people. Again, it was some of the women. We've noted already their devotion uh, throughout this last week of the life of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but it is also significant in relation to the historical record of the resurrection. Women as witnesses were not given too much credence in court. Uh, men's uh, testimony was accepted far more than the testimony of women in that culture. And so it is significant that there is no sense of seeking to hide who were those who were first on the scene, who were first to see the risen saviour. And it adds credence, it adds reliability and strength to the resurrection accounts that this is kept in. Had it been a made up story, the chances are that it would have been those followers of the Lord, <coughs> those followers of the Lord Jesus, uh, the 11, who would have been first on the scene. They would have believed straight away. They would have been going out straight away to tell others. But none of that happens. The fact that the women were the first there, the first to see, the women were the ones who carried the message to the disciples, the disciples' initial unbelief, all of it comes together to uh, show a real uh, account of what was happening. It is demonstrating that this is recording actual historic facts as it happened. And so we have um, we have the woman, uh, we have uh, the time, we have the people. It was the woman and we note their devotion and we note the importance of the fact that this is a reliable historical account of what happened uh, at that resurrection morning. Notice the purpose for which they were coming. It was to bring sweet spices in order that they might anoint him. Now, again, this is significant in terms of the overall big picture of the story, uh, because it is very evident from the fact that the women were taking spices to anoint a dead body. It is very evident from the lack of belief from the disciples that they were not expecting Jesus to rise from the dead. And even though the Lord Jesus had told them over and over again that this would happen, it is clear that the disciples and the woman here were not expecting the event. And of course, this would have all sorts of implications then uh, on some of the other theories that are put forward to explain the empty tomb. And it would also add further credence that the disciples were the original skeptics. They were the ones who were not expecting it, and they were the ones who didn't believe it. And yet these were the ones that ultimately went out to preach that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead. They needed to be convinced that the event had happened. And so we see all these little things point to the fact that this is an actual event of history. And so we see uh, uh, verses one and two, a great savor, the devotion of the woman, the bringing of the spices. Now, when we come to verses three and four, uh, we uh, read concerning a great stone, a great stone. Uh, they had a potential problem as the woman uh, came along to the tomb. Uh, they were talking about how they were going to move the stone because it says, in verse number four, for it was very great. You know, we sometimes feel like that. Well, we're heading off to do a job, uh, but all we can see is the potential problem, that there is a great stone in the way of what we desire to do for the Lord. 
And here these women were talking about the problem on the way. But the problem was rolled away. The problem was rolled away by a hand that was not theirs. It was rolled away by a divine hand. You know, how many cases throughout history has there been where uh, the followers of the Lord Jesus are worrying about the great stone that will hinder uh, their devotion and their service for the Lord, only to find that when it gets to the point, the Lord has rolled the stone away and he demonstrates that he has even bigger plans than we ever anticipated. These women, uh, they wanted the stone to be rolled away so that they could anoint a body that was dead. When they came, they found that a divine hand had rolled the problem away and, in fact, had shown them an even greater plan, a greater purpose that God had in store for them and in store for the Savior. I suppose the question that came to my mind is, are we prepared for the stone to be rolled away? Are we prepared uh, that as we step forward in seeking to serve the Lord, God might reveal something that is far greater than we could ever have imagined and reveal a service far greater than we ever thought we'd be engaged in? Are we prepared? Are we prepared for the stone to be rolled away? Thirdly, as we come to verses six through to eight, uh, we have now not a great saver or a great stone, but a great shock, a great shock. And notice uh, that Mark records vividly uh, in the words that he uses the utter shock that these women got as they came to the tomb. It says, verse number five, they were affrighted. Uh, the idea of this word is to be thrown into terror or amazement. And I guess the two things combined in their hearts. Uh, it says in verse number eight that they fled. That they, they almost couldn't get away fast enough. After the message from the angels and they had seen the empty tomb, they just wanted to get away. They were so scared. And as they fled, they were trembling. They were literally quaking with fear. And verse number eight says they were amazed, amazed. The idea of that word amazed is uh, literally a displacement of the mind. A displacement of the mind. Uh, we'd probably use the word bewildered. Uh, they, they, their minds were just turned upside down from everything that they were expecting. Things were just turned completely on their head. And it takes a while for your head to get, uh, get around things, doesn't it? When things suddenly happen with a shock and they were utterly bewildered. And also they were afraid. They were afraid. They were alarmed by what had happened, and they were in awe of what had happened. And so you see, uh, they came to the tomb, and they had a great shock. The first thing that caused a great shock was the, an angel, the appearance of a young man in a long white garment. You know, they were expecting to find something in the tomb. But they were not expecting something living, and they were certainly not expecting an angel. You can just imagine, even if it had been another person, that would have been shocking enough. But here now is an angel. It's no wonder they were uh, affrighted. Uh, then there was the announcement, the angel, and then there was the announcement. He gives an assurance, first of all, don't be affrighted. You know, perhaps he, he used that kind of expression to seek to remind them of the times when the Lord Jesus had said, fear not. The Lord Jesus had said that on numerous occasions, hadn't they? numerous occasions, hadn't he? And the angel echoes those words by saying, do not be affrighted. You know, it's interesting that as the angel gives his announcement, how specific he is. You know, the name Jesus or Jeshua. Joshua would have been a common name 
at that time. And so he doesn't just say, uh, Jesus is not here. Notice how specific he is uh, in his message. He says, ye seek Jesus of Nazareth. He's very definite as to acknowledging who it is that they're seeking. He gives his name, the place of residence, and then he gives the mode, the manner of death, which was crucified. And so you've got three things combining to define who it is that the people are looking for. Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. There was no doubt that he was speaking. He was announcing about the one who they were exactly looking for. And so he gives an assurance and then he gives an assertion. He is risen and gives the details of the one who rose from the dead. And then he gives an invitation, an invitation. He says, come see the place where the Lord lay. It's not as if he stood outside guarding the tomb and saying, yeah, he's risen, but then doesn't let them look inside. He invites them in and he says, have a good look and see the place where the Lord lay. And of course, uh, some of these women knew where the Lord lay, for they had seen the Lord buried the um, uh, two or three days uh, before, three days before, after the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. The words of the angels, the word of the angel was combined with the sight of their eye. Notice it was the place where he had laid. No more was he there. What a glorious life changing event. It's no wonder that later on, once the apostles actually believed it, it's no wonder that they kept coming back to it in their messages uh, and in their writings. For if the resurrection is true, then it truly is a life changing event. And then the angel, uh, after uh, giving uh, an assurance, an announcement, an assertion and an invitation, he gives a commission. And in some ways, the commission uh, is a, a foreshadowing of the greater commission that the Lord Jesus would give at the end of the chapter. Uh, for he says to uh, the woman, uh, go back and tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. And notice the lovely touch that Mark, who probably got a lot of his information uh, from Peter, uh, uh, singles out Peter here. And of course, when we think back to Peter's failure, uh, it is lovely that the angel uh, specifies Peter that the Lord wants Peter to know that he is risen uh, and that there is that chance uh, to uh, repent and to be restored uh, to him. You know, in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, there is the assurance of forgiveness. And so we have in verses one uh, through uh, to eight, uh, we have uh, the lovely uh, truth uh, brought before us of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. But then in verses nine to 14, we have the revealing of the resurrected Lord, the revealing of the resurrected Lord. Now, before we go any further, it should be noted that if you're reading from um, uh, a version um, certain versions, uh, they may well either have a note before we get to verse number nine uh, that uh, this section doesn't appear in some manuscripts, or they may even have completely left it uh, out. Uh, so uh, some people would wonder whether uh, this last section should actually uh, be part of Mark's gospel. Now, we do note that a couple of the oldest manuscripts do not have this section down to the end of the chapter. However, one of those two does leave a space uh, as if uh, it, th there should be something else to go there. Secondly, um, the ending, if you ended it at uh, verse number eight, there's all kinds of reasons why uh, that would be very, very strange and why it would indicate that uh, 
there's likely to be more uh, that was written. It doesn't make sense grammatically. It ends, uh, if you're reading it in the Greek, it ends with the word for. It just doesn't make sense. Uh, thematically, uh, as in in terms of the theme that is being developed, it doesn't make sense either. Uh, because if you ended in verse eight, you'd end with the disciples uh, or the woman being afraid and the message not even getting to the disciples. When we come to the end of uh, this section, the style is very similar to the rest of the book. The content of it is orthodox. There's nothing in this section which goes against what we have in other Gospels. Uh, and finally, uh, as my suggestions as to why uh, this is likely to be genuine, uh, is that uh, it is quoted in full in the second century by one of the early church fathers. Uh, and so it seemed that um, it was certainly accepted and known very, very early on. So I suggest to you that although there is it missing from these two oldest manuscripts, it appears in a multitude of other manuscripts. And for these other reasons, I suggest uh, that we can rely upon it. As I said, so we have uh, the revealing of the resurrected Lord in this section, and it deals with um, an appearance to an individual, an appearance to two, and then an appearance to a group. And Mark seems to pick out these three things uh, in uh, particular uh, to show how that the Lord uh, appeared to individuals when he rose, he appeared to small groups and then to larger groups as uh, well. Again, we've commented that this section reveals that those closest to the disciples, uh, closest to the Lord, were not expecting a resurrection. And so we have a pattern that is revealed. There's the revelation of the resurrected Lord. There's a report to the disciples and there is the rejection of that report. So first of all, the appearance to an individual. The person was Mary Magdalene, out of whom the Lord had cast seven demons. John's gospel tells us of the sorrow that she had over the disappearance of the body of the Lord. Luke 7 would remind us that those who have been forgiven much love much as well. And here is a woman who, understanding that she had been released from these seven demons, had spent her life since then seeking to minister to the Lord and seeking to follow him. And now she's desperate to do this one last act that she could in seeking to properly bury the body of the Lord Jesus. She desired to do this last service uh, for him. And so the Lord reveals himself uh, to her and she goes and reports it to those who had spent three years with him. And notice what it says. She went and told them that had been with him. They had spent time with him. And so it's no wonder that they were mourning. The idea is to grieve. And they were weeping, weeping aloud, the outshowing of that mourning. They were utterly convinced that the Lord had died. And at the report of Mary, their reaction is un. A belief. You know, the Jews believed that resurrection was bodily and physical. It wasn't a spiritual resurrection. And they knew that such a thing was very, very rare, very, very unusual. And so they were the original skeptics, and they needed some serious convincing that the Lord had risen. And the report of one person, and if we can use their mindset, that of a woman, was not going to convince them that he had indeed risen. And so in verses 12 to 13, Mark shifts it up a little bit and re uh, records how the Lord uh, appeared to two. Now, Luke's gospel records this uh, incident in more detail as two were traveling on the road to the village called Emmaus and the Lord appears to them as they walk into the country. And notice that both to Mary and to 
uh, these two, it says that he appeared. This is no ghostly, shadowy appearance. But this, the idea of the word appear is to render manifest. This is a clear showing, a clear demonstration. And so uh, the Lord appears to these two. He speaks to them. And then uh, and so he reveals himself to them in uh, at least two ways. Number one, uh, through repeating what the scriptures say concerning him. And he brings to their mind all that the scriptures had said concerning the suffering, the death, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Uh, but then uh, they were brought to an understanding through familiar actions. Uh, the breaking of the bread would have reminded them of the Lord. And then the obvious physical marks that they would have seen in their hands. And so they were convinced. Their eyes were opened, Luke says. They were convinced. And so they head back to tell the residue that they have seen the Lord. But Mark records that again, the report is rejected. And so one was not enough. Two was not enough. Well, we had three now. And in the mouth of two or three witnesses, uh, they were uh, supposed to accept the truth of something. And so now the Lord has to appear to the 11 together. And so we have uh, the revelation. He appears unto them, unto the 11, as they sat at meat. Then we have the reproach. Uh, the Lord speaks very strongly to them. I wondered whether there's a link back to Mark's gospel in chapter nine, uh, chapter eight, sorry. For in, Mark, in chapter eight, the Lord had warned his disciples about the problem of the, 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 the leaven of the, the, the Pharisees and of Herod. And that leaven was that of unbelief and hardness of heart. And I wonder whether uh, the memories of the conversation that they had had on that day came into their mind as the Lord reproaches them with their unbelief. They're accused of unfaithful or faithlessness and a hard heart, a lack of spiritual perception and a lack of understanding. The reason for the reproach was that they hadn't believed those that God had sent to them after he rose from the dead. I wonder whether this had a significance uh, for the future work of the disciples. You know, at times as believers, we can get frustrated with those who are unbelievers, that they just can't see the truth that Christ died for their sins and they rose again from the dead. And, and we can be tempted to get uptight and annoyed. Uh, we can be tempted to potentially uh, treat unbelievers as um, second-class citizens, that they haven't seen the truth. But it's interesting that right at the beginning, those that were to go out with this message had to be upbraided, reproached for their unbelief. I just wonder whether as they went out to preach the message of the resurrection, they would have gone out with a sense that they took some convincing. It took some time for them to understand the truth of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And it would have given them patience and sensitivity as they sought to share this truth with others. I certainly think uh, that it should impact us as we consider this section, and as we consider the commission that Christ sends us on, that we should go out with a degree of sensitivity, and with a degree of patience and understanding with those that would hear the message and would perhaps take some time to accept it. May we be patient as we seek to witness of the living Lord. In verses 15 to 18, he gives a commission for the company. Notice the scope of the commission, the scope of the commission is not to be local. It's not to be local at all. Notice what he says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You can't get around the words every 
and all. This is a message to be declared without discrimination. You know, the gospel is the ultimate message in equality. The ultimate message in equality. Why? Because Romans 3 would remind us of this truth, that all have sinned. There is no difference. Every single person has sinned. And no flesh can be justified by the works of the law. Romans 10 verse 12 would say this. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. And it's not so much now in the equality in the fact that we're all sinners, but it's the equality in the fact that the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And so we have an equal message. We're all sinners. We have an equal message that there is salvation for all because the Lord Jesus has shown mercy to all and is available to all that call upon him. So that Romans 10 verse 13 would have those lovely words for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Praise God that this is a message for the whole world. You know, this would have been shocking to this group. Here were uh, a group of Jews and uh, they had uh, been taught and brought up that they were the chosen people of God. They were unique and they were special in their relationship with God. And now here was their leader, the Lord Jesus, commissioning them to go into the world with an equal message for every single one, because it was to every creature. It's an expression that emphasizes the individual within all the world. None are to be excluded from the message. There is none too high or too low. There is none too good or too bad for this message. All have sinned. All need the Savior. And so we have the scope of the commission, and then we have the split that the commission will cause. Because wherever the gospel was to be preached, there would be a division. Some would believe and others not. The Lord clearly spells out the significance of the message. Reception of it would result in salvation. Rejection of it would result in damnation. The idea is condemnation or judgment. You know, the Christian message is so much more than a message of social justice, so much more uh, than uh, simply a message of changing lives for this world. And the message of the gospel concerning Christ is a message which impacts for eternity, for it is a message which, if received, will save from the judgment of God. It is a message, if rejected, is a um, will result in the condemnation, the judgment of God for all eternity. For those that would hesitate uh, to uh, speak a message that includes judgment, we should heed these words of the Lord amongst others. And notice that the message is that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Baptism is that outward uh, demonstration, the outward showing of an inward belief. While this verse indicates that baptism is necessary for salvation, the weight of the New Testament is against this interpretation, where salvation clearly comes upon belief and then baptism follows. However, I would suggest to you that in a society that had publicly rejected Christ, the act of public association with Christ was a very necessary expectation. This couldn't just be something that would be simply private. There had to be that declaration of public association with Christ. Otherwise, there would be question marks as to whether they're truly was faith in the believer. And indeed, in some countries today, 
It is only upon the baptism of someone when they are prepared to take that public step uh, that the wider community will actually accept that there has been a conversion in their life. And so baptism is an expectation for every true believer. But the weight of the New Testament uh, uh, demonstrates that salvation is through faith alone, uh, by grace alone. Uh, although baptism is a very clear expectation that should follow that. So we have the scope of the commission, the split that the commission would cause, and then we have the signs that would follow the commission. Uh, it says in verse 17, and these signs shall follow them that believe. The idea of follow is attend to, be attached to. And so wherever those who believe, then these things would follow. And so there's the power to cast out demons in the name of Christ, uh, the power to speak with new tongues. Uh, the idea of a uh, new there is fresh uh, tongues, languages, which uh, were known languages, but not known to the person who were speaking it, uh, languages that they were unlearned in. Uh, there's the defiance of death, uh, and then there's the healing of the sick so that they would recover. And of course, all of these things are recorded for us in the book of Acts, uh, demonstrating that uh, the truth of what the Lord had said uh, had indeed come uh, to pass come to pass. Now, the purpose of these signs that were attending the message that were going out is explained for us in Hebrews chapter two. Uh, for it says there in verse number four, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with diverse miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his will. And so these sign gifts uh, were associated with the message as it went out. Now, as we go through scripture, uh, there's very clear marked um, points where there is an explosion of the miraculous. Uh, and so we have it uh, when Moses um, begins to lead the people of Israel. Uh, we have Elijah at the beginning of the time of the prophets. And then we have it when the Lord comes to reveal himself as a Messiah. And then at the beginning of the church age. And the Lord uses the miraculous to give witness to the fact that these are works of him. But they do not continue in the same degree and the same quantity. Uh, and so while we would not uh, put a blanket black ban and say that these things can never and will never happen today, uh, I would suggest to you that they would be the rarity rather than uh, the common expectation. For as the scriptures have been finished, God has revealed to us through his word that which he desires us to know. Uh, and we have had uh, a multitude of historic demonstration of the truth of the Christian message. Finally, in verses 19 to 20, we have uh, laboring with the Lord, laboring with the Lord. And so in chapter one, we had the Lord coming down and a path being made um, clear for him as he came down. Here now, as we come to the end of this section, we have the perfect servant who has completed his work. And now he has gone back to heaven. This is truly the triumph of the servant. Notice, first of all, his reception. He was received up into heaven. The idea is to take to oneself. The servant is welcomed home. The work of the cross is done. The master welcomes the faithful one home to a position of privilege and glory. He is sat at the right hand of God. Now, this is uh, uh, the, the position that is brought before us time and time again regarding uh, the Lord Jesus now. 
that it is the place of favor, the place of privilege, the place of responsibility and glory at the Father's right hand. And the book of Hebrews would especially bring this truth uh, before us. Praise God that in relation to the work of sin, he sits down. It's finished. It is done. But notice that his work continues. His work continues. For it says here that they, the disciples, preached everywhere the Lord working with them. So there is another work that is not done. There is the fulfilling of the Great Commission. I want you to notice uh, the lovely obedience of the disciples. Having been convinced of the resurrection, they go forth and they preach everywhere. And it's interesting. I was just recently looking up uh, how and where the disciples died. And uh, some uh, one reached India, some reached North Africa. Of course, the Apostle Paul reached Europe uh, and uh, the disciples, they spread. And it's amazing when you think that this group of 11 and all that came from that Having been convinced of his resurrection, they went out in full confidence and conviction of the message that they were preaching. Notice not only their obedience, but their fellowship, their fellowship. You know, we couldn't do it on our own, could we? And after all, it, the Lord himself said that it was him that would build his church. It is his work ultimately. But notice the lovely fellowship that his people have in him with him in the work the lord working with them confirming the word with signs following as he had said you know the great commission is both a great responsibility but also a wonderful privilege we have been charged to go out and to preach and we are ambassadors for christ it is a responsibility, but what a privilege to represent the perfect servant. What a privilege that as citizens of heaven, we are here to represent our Lord and to speak a message of reconciliation. Let us seek to emulate the perfect servant as we seek to obey the Great Commission. Let us remember that just as the character of Christ and the character of his message tied in together, May it be that our character is in keeping with the message that we preach. And may we go out in the full knowledge and assurance of the truth of the resurrection. That as Paul would say to the Corinthians, that as we contemplate that, that we are steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. We go out in the knowledge and the power of the resurrection, knowing that although we preach to those who are dead in trespasses and in sins, we are preaching a message of one who can give life, for he is the resurrection and the life. And may we go out in his name and in his power and the same power that worked in Christ. May it be that it works in us and through us as his representatives as well. And may we rejoice that one day we will meet the perfect servant. And we trust and pray that our lives may have been such that we will be greeted with those lovely words of commendation. Well done, good and faithful servant. Shall we pray? Our Father, we're grateful. We've been able to come to such a wonderful end, uh, to such a lovely gospel. And our Father, we pray that our hearts might be stirred both as we contemplate the glorious truth of the resurrection, but also as we contemplate the great responsibility uh, of the Great Commission. And we pray that this week we might indeed go out and do whatever you would encourage us to do, whatever you would prompt us to do, uh, wherever you would lead us to go. We pray that we might be those uh, who would share with others the grand and glorious message of salvation through the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ. For there is Salvation in no other name under heaven that is given amongst uh, men. And so our God just bless us, keep us, guide us, and encourage us through the week ahead, we pray. In our Saviour's lovely name. Amen.